So as I mentioned, we launched a brand new series last week entitled Great Choices, Great Life. Uh, we have a saying in our household, in the Lopez household, that we tell our kids all the time, good choices, good life. And as we were thinking about this, I don't want to just have a good, anybody here just not want to have just a good life? You want a great life? Anybody here? Uh, okay, six of you. Well, uh, all right, but the rest of you, my desire, and I, let me just share with you where my heartbeat comes with this. My desire is I believe that God has created us, many of us, for so much more than we are living for. And a lot of that boils down to the choices and the decisions that we are making. And that idea of making a decision comes with the framework that says, if I choose this, then I am not going to choose these things. It is an isolation to say, I want to choose God's best for my life. And how many of you would believe, you don't have to raise your hand, that God knows what's better for your life, what's best for your life, than even you do. And as we navigated through this, last week we talked about the highest priority, the, the biggest decision that you can make, the greatest choice that you can ever make, is to make God the highest priority of your life. I want to encourage you, if you did not listen to that, it's not because it's a great message or I feel like I did a great job. It's because it is the pivotal decision of your life, of you making that decision to say, God, you will be first place in my life, and how do you go about doing that? It is the greatest choice, and everything else flows out of that. Over the course of the next five weeks, we're going to talk about some of the most key relationships in our lives. We're going to talk about, for some of us, parents and grandparents, we're going to talk about next week, the relationship with our finances. We're going to talk about in a couple of weeks after that, our friendships. We're going to talk about on Super Bowl Sunday how to avoid some landmines in your life that will destroy and jack up your life. And today, we're going to talk about one of the most crucial relationships that many of us have right now. Not all of us have this. It is your marriage. So turn to somebody right now and go, it's okay, we're going to talk about marriage. Just tell them that it is okay, we're going to talk about marriage. Choice Number two today, some of you are like, oh, I wish I would have known what the topic was. I wouldn't have shown up. Oh, I'm reading your mind already. Second great choice, don't be, uh, don't be discouraging to your pastor. Anyway, uh, choice number two, your first choice, making God my highest priority. Second choice that we're going to talk about today, I will build a great marriage. Would you just say that with me? I will build a great marriage. For those of you who are married today, this would be the pivotal moment of choosing, of making a decision. And I think one of the things that this whole series is resonating for me is I believe that many of us are coasting through life doing okay. Yeah, your marriage is all right. Your job is okay. Your finances are okay. Your relationship with God, it's all right. When do we get to a spot where we make a determination of I don't want to be just like everybody else I want to experience God's greatest for my life. And for those of you who have the privilege of being married today, the, one, the most important earthly relationship that you have is with your husband or with your wife. Rodney Dangerfield, if you remember him, uh, he is a comedian, uh, said these words, my wife and I were happy for 25 years. And then we met. So, you know, and sometimes that's just this reality of marriage. If we go through this for just a moment, if love is a dream, then marriage is the alarm clock. Have you ever heard that, right? There are three, three rings that are important in marriage, right? The first is the engagement ring. The second, the wedding ring. And finally, you have the suffering. You know, and you, we talk about these things, right? Because it's a reality. It's sometimes what we feel about marriage and we joke about it. As a matter of fact, the German poet Heinrich Hein, this is fascinating to me. He bequeathed his entire estate to his widow. He knew that he was about to pass away. And so he, in his will, passes everything along to his widow on one condition. And that condition is that she would ultimately have to remarry. Well, that was, seemed like an odd thing. Why not just pass all of this stuff down to your wife? And he was asked, why on earth did you give it all to her only on one condition that she had to get remarried? And he said, so that there would be at least one man on earth who would regret my death. You know, so I, you think about this, right? And it's funny. And we laugh about it. And we get a good joke about it. And that old saying of the secret to a happy marriage remains a secret. You know, all of these things that just kind of give us a chuckle about the marriage relationship. 
But the truth is, I think as followers of Christ, our goal should be that those would not be indicative of our lifestyles with our spouse. We would have a great relationship with our spouse. As a matter of fact, a man by the name of Joseph Choate, he was the one-time U.S. ambassador to Great Britain, was asked if he could come back to earth as one human being, just one, after he died, who would he want to be? And I love this statement. He says this. I would choose to be Mrs. Choate's second husband. Man, you think about that for a moment. That his relationship with his wife was so great that of everything he says, man, I would come back to be her second husband. And today I want to talk about marriage because I don't believe that the secret to a happy marriage is a secret. I believe God has given that. He has ordained that to us. He has written that out in Scripture. And we are going through this series, as I mentioned, of great choices, great life, that today you would start and begin as a husband and as a wife, that we would begin to start making some choices that would lead us to build a great marriage. So as you know, we said we were going to be starting this in the book of Proverbs. So I want to encourage you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, I tricked you there. So this is the only week that we're going to be navigating outside, but the book of Ephesians has so much truth about the marital relationship that God has given to us through the Apostle Paul that I feel like we just need to park there for today. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there with me now, Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. We're going to look predominantly at chapter 5, and then at the tail end of this, we're going to be examining chapter 4. And I want to set out from the onset here, we are not going to be talking about every detail in the marriage relationship. There is so much I've got about uh, only about 30 minutes or so to dialogue with you about the role of a husband and a wife. We're going to be cruising over at a 30,000 foot view, trying to navigate and give you some practical tools today of how do you make that determination to say, I am going to build a great marriage. So find yourself Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be starting at verse 21. And as you're turning there, I want to briefly stop and give some, uh, some attention to those of you in this room that you say, well, Brian, what about me? I'm not married. Uh, maybe for some of you, you're saying to yourself, I'm, I'm a widow. For some of you, you've never been married. For some of you, you're young. You're in your high school years or your college years, maybe even junior high years, and you're, you're here. And, and I, I want to share this with you. This is the encouragement. Being single isn't bad. As a matter of fact, it can be a blessing. Being single is not a bad thing. I feel like sometimes in the church environments, we give so much attention and credence to marriage, and we're going to be talking about marriage today, but I want you to know that you are not less than, you are not missing out because you are single today. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. The Apostle Paul This great evangelist who God used in incredible ways, at least at this time in his life, is unmarried. And he says, I want to let you know, it's better. Later on in that chapter, he would say, the reason for that is because when you're married, you have to give yourself to somebody. You have to give to their needs. And and if you're single, you can devote your entire life to God. If you are single here today, it is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, it can be a tremendous blessing. And not only that, later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes these words, but those who marry will face many troubles in life. Some of you have a new favorite verse in the Bible. You're like, oh, that's me. And and I want to spare you from this. The reality is, Paul says, you've got two people that are coming together, and there are going to be challenges. There's going to be head-butting moments. There will be conflict. And so I just want to spend some time just to address those of you who right now may be widowed. And today, as we talk about marriage, it's like, oh, man. Maybe today would be a day of thanking God for the relationship that he had blessed you with. And it is a change. And I know for some of you, these have been recent events, and this is a hard season to navigate through. And I want to let you know, I have been praying for you this week, even as we're talking about this. But maybe to just step back and go, man, God, I thank you for the spouse, even as we navigate through the instructions to husbands and wives that you gave me for a time here on this earth to enjoy. For some of you who really have no desire to be married, you're like, I'm not going to get married. Let this today be a picture of something bigger than just the marriage relationship, but a picture of Christ's relationship with the church, Christ's relationship with you. And for those of you who maybe 
Maybe you don't want to get married, but maybe God would have that in your future. And some of you who are single today and you're just not married yet, today is a day, great day to stop and think through, am I prepared to be the husband or to be the wife that God is desiring for me to be? And maybe that's your choice to say, I'm not married today, but I want to choose now to do the things in my life that will make a great, a great marriage down the road. So Ephesians chapter 5 is where we find ourselves, starting at verse 21. And this is what it says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own bodies, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I think it'd be appropriate that I pray for us right now. <laughs> Father, I just invite you to come and to speak. And I realize that there are a multitude of people in here. Some who today are not married. Some who are married just recently and this is a new adventure and it's so exciting. God, some who have great marriages and Lord, there are some of us in here, if we're honest, we're struggling. And maybe there are some that it's just barely holding on by a thread. And so, Lord, I just pray that in a way, a powerful way that only you can, that your spirit would invade, that you would speak, that you would meet us here. And that instead of pointing the finger at what somebody else should be doing, maybe we would look at ourselves and what you've called us to do first. So, Lord, do your work your way. Encourage those who need encouragement. Challenge those of us who maybe have become complacent. And God, that we would walk out of this place knowing that we have heard from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to give you some instructions, men. Is that okay? How many of you are guys here this morning? Can I hear it? Yeah. Yes. So I want you to do something with me. Imagine yourself looking at all the other men in the room, and you're going to say this, just the men, not the ladies. This is important. Say this, be a man. Say that, be a man. Say it one more time like you mean it. Be a man. What does it mean to be the husband of your home? And Paul lays out some very specific instructions. And I'm going to start here because if you look at this passage, the bulk of it is written to us, and I will include myself here as husbands. And I want to give you three primary means of what we can do, God's instructions for us, to build a great marriage. The first one is this, lead my wife responsibly. Would you say that with me, men? Lead my wife responsibly. Lead her responsibly. This is what the passage says in Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, I would be willing to bet that this is one of the passages in the Bible as we have read through that even some of you ladies, I can just feel your skin is crawling as we read through that. What do you mean submit? What do you mean submit, right? And does that mean I have to submit to everybody? My husband, you don't know my husband. I would never submit, right? And all of these details going on in your mind. This is one of those passages in the scriptures that I believe has been abused probably more than any other. You hear this amongst men of uh, husbands, oh, you need to submit, woman, you need to do what I, and, and we forget, and this is why it is so important what I read in verse 21. Did you catch what it said? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is this idea for you as a husband, men, that we are the responsible party in the household. That is what headship is. It is not this dictator. It is not lordship. It is that the buck 
stops with you. You may be wondering, well, how can you show that, Brian? Isn't this? I just, and if you are, are the individual who comes home and tells your wife, you need to submit, woman, because, let me tell you, please stop doing that. You are destroying your marriage relationship. There's this incredible story in Genesis chapter 3, first book of the Bible, third chapter, and we see all of these great things. God creates the heavens and the earth. It was formless and void, and he starts making and shaping the earth and the stars and the sun and all of these crazy things, and then animals, and then man, and then woman, and this relationship, and everything's going great, and God gives them some specific instructions. Hey, you can eat of all sorts of things, but don't eat of this specific tree. And then we find ourselves in chapter 3 of Genesis, where Eve is in a conversation with a serpent that is talking to her, and he is encouraging her, hey, did God really say, oh, don't do this? And ultimately, we see that she takes a bite of the fruit, and then there's something in there that if you're not careful, you miss. It says, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her. It's this incredible moment that I almost picture Eve being tempted and Adam sitting back, watching it all unfold and doing very little to protect his wife and to lead. And then, as you know the rest of the story, they get this great, great idea. They look at each other. They're like, we're naked. We feel shame. What do you want to do? Well, let's sew some fig tree leaves together. I mean, how awkward is that, right? And that's what they do. And then God comes into the garden. You probably know the story. And you know who he calls? He calls Adam. Adam, where are you? Does God know what's happened? Of course. Why not call Eve? She was the first one. Because Adam is the head of his marriage. And he is the responsible party. And God calls him to account. You're kind of looking silly, Adam, with those fig leaves. That's Brian's translation. That's not in there, but... Kind of looks weird. Eve too. Did you guys eat? And you know what Adam does? It's so funny what Adam does because he does what most of us who are boys in men's bodies do. He goes, God, the woman that you gave me, right? She made me do it. And it's your fault. You gave her to me. And do you see where I'm going with this? That if we are going to be the heads as Christ is the head of the church, The buck stops with you and me. I'm the leader of my marriage. God is going to call me to an account one day of how my marriage relationship was. And I've just got to be honest. There's going to become some things that I'll probably share with passion because I hear it a lot. When I sit down with people who are struggling in their marriage and the first thing out of the husband's mouth is always, well, you know what, if she, if this, if they... If this, and it's always a finger pointing to everybody else. And I'm just going to tell you, God has an expectation for us as men that we be men and step up to the leadership position that he has called us to be, that we would be the heads, not in a dictator role, but as a responsibility role. Does this make sense right now, gentlemen? It is what God has called you and I to. The buck has to stop someplace. And I'm just going to say this. If you haven't learned to lead yourself, it's going to be very difficult to lead your wife and to lead your family. And that's why putting God as the highest point of our life is the most critical in everything that we do. Because you want to be a great, fo- a great leader, you know where it starts? By first becoming a great follower of Jesus Christ. He will make you into a great leader. Let me ask you guys this question. You say, well, my wife doesn't, if she just followed me, that would be awesome. I could lead this household. Can I just ask this? Would you follow you? Uh Uh-oh, that got quiet and serious all of a sudden. Would you follow you? Are you leading your family, your spouse, in such a manner that you'd say, I would follow me because of the lifestyle, the example that I'm setting? Number one, lead my wife responsibly. Number two, gentlemen, would you say this with me? Love my wife sacrificially. Say that. Love my wife sacrificially. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. There's an old story that I heard years ago about a couple that was going through some uh, counseling. And finally, the the pastor just looked at him and said, you know what, you guys, uh, just doesn't seem like you got a lot of love in your relationship. He turns to the husband and he says, when was the last time you told your wife you loved her? 
And he goes, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, just when's the last time you just said I love you? He says, well, on our wedding day, I said I loved you and I haven't revoked it yet. You know, so the point that I'm trying to make here, right, is that we get to the spots that we are constantly demonstrating love to our wife and that being sacrificial. Paul talks about this. How do we know that? It's Jesus. He gave himself up. He did not come to be served. If you got married hoping that your wife would fulfill all your needs and that was the expectation and, oh, she's going to make my life, she's going to serve me and all these details, you're going to have a frustrating marriage because that's not what marriage is according to the Bible. It is about sacrificially loving my wife. How are you loving your wife sacrificially today? Do you put her needs above your own? Are there times when maybe you talk about vacation and what is it that you're going to do today or or, or on your vacation? Do do you surrender to that? Your time, your investment, what you do on a Saturday. Are you always going fishing? Oh, wait a minute. That got really serious. So are you always doing something that you want to do versus putting her above yourself that you would love her sacrificially? And then what ties right into this is the third one. Care for her personally. Would you say that with me? Care for her personally. In verses 28 and 29, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. Am I taking care of her needs like I would take care of myself? Because as the scripture says, the two become one. If she's hurting, guess what I'm hurting? You've heard that old saying, right? Happy spouse, happy house, happy wife, happy life. How about healthy wife, healthy marriage? Am I putting her needs above my own? Gentlemen, when was the last time you just sat down and asked, how are you doing? When was the last time you just said, physically, are you doing okay? Emotionally, where are you at? You need a day? Then go and take that day. I'll, I'll give that to you. You need a break? Maybe if you're a wife who does a lot of the housekeeping stuff and maybe you're a husband, you could say, hey, I can do this. I can take care of that. Why don't you just relax or do whatever you want to do? Can I share some wise advice that I heard a long time ago? No man has ever been shot while doing the dishes. It just hasn't happened, right? (laughs) To say, I will sacrifice whatever it takes for you to care for your needs, spiritually speaking, to look out and after you. And gentlemen, I know we talked about, would you lead? Would you follow your lead? But can I ask this? Would you want to be married to you? And the way you care for your wife's needs and lift her up and lead your household, would you say, yeah, I'd want to be married to somebody like me who's taking care of my family, looking out after their best interests? There's a couple of books I'd encourage maybe some of you to read, and if you haven't done so already, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, great book. Um, Love and Respect, which we're going to talk about in just a moment of of the wife's role here. And and maybe those can be some things as a husband and wife relationship. You can sit down and read together and just say, how do we care for one another? How How do we love one another? How do I lead you well? So husbands, lead responsibly, love sacrificially, care for your wife personally. Now we're going to get into the wife's instructions for wives. And I want to be really upfront about this. I don't have the courage to talk to you about this right now. So So what I have decided to do was I went and got a leading expert on wives, very well-known, well-renowned public speaker, my wife, Rachel Lopez, to come on up here and to share. So uh, would you invite my wife up here as she talks about instructions for the wives? (laughs) Josh, good job, buddy. I did not know that was coming. (laughs) Love you. (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of um, that's our new song actually <laughs> um, but I just wanted to share I was cracking up as Brian was like just going over um, 1 Corinthians seven twenty eight and just the words of Paul and I wonder how he spoke these words to the people was he like but those who marry will face many many troubles in life and I want to spare you this was it like that or was it like but those who marry will face many troubles in life, and I want to spare you. You know, like, just what was the intensity of that? And I think the truth of the matter is we can all agree that marriage is tough. 
there are seasons that we have to trek through that are hard, that are difficult, and they are seasons. And so as we think about nature, that we have these seasons, we have spring, we have summer, we have fall, we have winter, the same is true in our relationships and in our marriage relationships. So if you think of the spring with me, think of your marriage when it's all new and fresh and you're like, you're amazing, it's so wonderful and beautiful here. And then come summer and you're like, I have the hots for him. He's amazing. Like, everything's perfect. I do have the hots for you. Um, but, you know, everything's amazing. You feel understood. You are understanding. You, I mean, you're just so dialed in. You know, summer's like the best season. And then comes fall, and things are getting a little cooler around, if you get what I'm saying. And um, things aren't as vibrant. The colors aren't as vibrant. Um, things are a little dry. And then along comes winter. And I think that for us as Northern California people, we don't really get the well we have this year. But normally, winter isn't too terrible. Um, but you think about that. Like, if we are always thinking of marriage as um, a spring or a summer, we're really going to be disappointed in our marriages. But when we expect it, when we're prepared for it, as we are the seasons, we can endure a lot more. So I just want you all, to, myself included, that we're encouraged that marriage is seasons. Do you agree with that? Have you experienced that? Um, so we need to expect troubles, expect winter, but commit to endurance. I love 1 Corinthians. It's not on the screen. It's not in your notes, but love bears all things. It endures all things. It endures all things. So uh, we are going to look at Ephesians. This is Ephesians 5, 21 through 24, and it says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, and for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as a church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So, the first takeaway is respect my husband. Um, I, I think it's interesting that it says in everything, in everything. So, as women, as wives, that we would look at ourselves holistically. And like Brian said, we can't cover all the things, right? So we're going to park on a few different things. Um, but I want to encourage us as women that we set the tone in our home. We set the tone in our home with how we respect our man. It impacts our relationship directly. It impacts our children. If we have children, it impacts our families, our neighborhoods, our communities, our church. It's a huge deal as women. We need to respect our men. It's a big, it's a call out from God. Um, so breaking it down in three different ways that we can show respect. The first is this, with my words. It's in your note, with my words. Um, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. This is from Ephesians 4.29. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. So instead of pointing out all the faults that we see in our men, um, to have those words of encouragement. And so I wanted to share just a story. This happened years and years ago. I was with a group of women, and there was one woman in our group in particular that was walking through a lot of hardship in her marriage relationship. And so she began to share. We listened. We're like, gosh, we're so sorry that you're walking through this situation. And then all of a sudden, one of the other women started sharing about her husband and how he was kind of missing the mark in different areas. And I was like, oh, buddy, I'm sorry. And then then it, the next lady started sharing about her husband. And I was like, oh, no, this is turning into like not a good situation. All the husband bashings, just it felt like that was happening. And so when you're in a super awkward situation like that, what do you do? You become awkward. And so I chose to be awkward and just say, ladies, I have this idea. And so I, I did affirm the girl that was walking through a lot. I said, I want you to know I'm so sorry that you're walking through this. But I think it'd be cool if we just shared maybe some of the things about our men that we appreciate, that we admire. And so they start sharing one by one. And at the end of our time together, they were like, all of us were saying, we married such good guys. Like you can shift. So as women, I want to encourage us in our words, in our homes, directly with our husbands, how we speak to him, it matters, and how we also speak of him in public, with our friends, with our families, that also matters. And beyond that, shifting, 
I guess the, the energy in the room, shifting the energy of the room, if you're in a group, in a room with women who are saying things that are negative, to turn it around for positive. So with my words, it's a big deal. Uh, Proverbs 18.21 says that the tongue has the power of life and of death, so let's speak life. Um, the second way that we can show respect to our husbands is with my actions. In 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, it says, Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love each other, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. And so I want to say that again. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with a blessing. And I think in marriage relationships, it's more common than it should be, but we have this tit for tat relationship. Like you were so rude to me. I'm going to be so rude to you. You hurt my feelings. I'm going to try to hurt your feelings. You didn't say good night to me. I'm not saying good morning to you. Like we literally act like junior hires playing house. Like it's so, we have to grow up and have these mature relationships where with our actions, we are showing respect to our man. Um, another way, and there's a hundred million, I'm sure, in our actions that we can demonstrate respect. But one thing I was thinking of is um, with blessing, to, to not repay evil with evil, insult with this insult, but with blessing is to take interest in the things that interest our husbands. And I wanna say, just Brian and I, both of us standing before you, we do not have a perfect marriage. I'm married to the perfect guy um, that's made for me, but we just, we have stuff that we have to work on. And so this is one area that just personally I need to work on. Do you want to know why? Because one thing that interests my husband is fishing. <laughs> it's fishing. I don't like fishing. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in a downrigger. I'm not interested in fishing <laughs> lures. There's things that come in the mail. I'm like, oh. Hey, I'm actually glad you brought this up in front of everybody. So <laughs> this is working out in my favor today. <laughs> so all the things I'm all, this is so boring. Okay, tell me more. I want to know all about those lake trout. Those lake trout are so cool. Talk to me about the bass. So not an interest at all. Like every time I go, I literally have to pray for the spirit of God to come upon me and to like empower me with like joy and happiness and kindness. And so I, I have gone like, like a real lots of what? Like twice. <laughs> it feels like a lot that I've gone out there. And every time I do prep myself, like, Lord, help me to have a happy heart. Cause a lot of times it's cold. So <laughs> my commitment as I was praying and I was like, I do want to be a blessing. I do in my actions want to show respect. And so I am going to fish more. It's my commitment. You it's heard my... it. You heard it. That's on video. Anyway. <laughs> so the first is with my words to show respect. The second is with my actions. And the third is with my attitude. Um, Ephesians 2, 3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interest of others. So it's not all about us. And I think a lot of times as women, it's easy to have attitude. Like God just, he's given it to us. We're so good at it. We have, we have a lot of girls in our house, so we know about attitude. Um, it's easy to have an attitude when we have hurt feelings, when we have unmet needs, unmet, unmet expectations, um, or just hormones. Let's be honest, we're keeping it real. Um, I want to share, years ago, um, Brian knows I was going to share this story. I was like, I just want to let you know I'm telling you a little story about you. Um, but we uh, were going to an event. It was a dress-up event. This is several years ago. And so um, he had been at work all day, came home. We're getting ready for it. So I was so dressed up. I was, like, decked out going. You know, it's not. We had small children at the time, so it's not every day you get to do that kind of thing. So I came out, and he's like, hey, babe, you ready? Ready to go? And I was like, you're, you're, this is the part you're supposed to say. I'm so cute. And you're so happy you're married to me. And nothing. He was just like, you're ready to go? And I was like, oh my gosh. I literally had attitude like on the, ver it was right there. It was right there. And I was like, no, this is, we are, I'm not having an attitude. So I went back in the room and I literally like shifted my perspective. Like, What can I do to change my attitude, but also have like 
an unmet need met. Like he needs to stink and say that he thinks I'm so cute in my outfit. And so I come out and I don't know if you guys know like the figure eight, it's like a figure eight walk. So I came out and I was like, hello. And I started walking like and looking at him. And so did this figure eight and he's like, hey. I was like, hey. And he said, what are you doing? And then, <laughs> I said, nothing, what are you doing? And he's like, nothing. And then he's like, you look real nice. And I was like, oh, this old thing? <laughs> Thank you. And so, um, and then a little bit later, he's like, you really do look so nice. And so, anyway, I think that it can be easy to have our feelings hurt, to have an attitude, to cop an attitude, to ruin the night. I could have done it. I really could have. I was like, right there. Um, but just shifting our perspective, getting creative help a brother out. It's not all about us, right? Who knows what the day looked like at work? Who knew? Who knows relationships um, with parents or whatever that looks like? So it's not all about us. We need to check ourselves, show our men respect um, in our words, in our actions, and with our attitude. Um, so as we live this thing out, just kind of going back to 1 Peter 3, 8, 9, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but be a blessing. My last closeout is just to be... A blessing. Can you guys say that? Ladies, say it. Be a blessing. Pray for your man. He is not your enemy. He's not your enemy. You're on the same stinking team. You guys have the same last name. You're on the same team. Your teammates, he needs you to be his cheerleader. Show up for him. Respect him with your words, with your attitude, and with your actions. Awesome. Thanks, babe. So I know we're running a little long on time, uh, and that's probably because of me, but um, I just want to give you some real practical building blocks of how do we build a really great marriage. And this is actually taken out of Ephesians chapter 4. It's just a chapter right before what we just read. And it's Paul's statement really to how we should engage with everybody, but if it's how we should engage with anybody, then how much more in the marriage relationship? And so I just want to run through these th three things very quickly. Number one, develop God-honoring communication. Develop God-honoring communication. If you're not married, this is, should be for us how we engage with people regardless. But I've got to be honest with you. I've sat in counseling appointments with a husband and a wife who have been cussing and swearing and calling each other every name in the book. And I think, if this is what you do in front of a pastor of a church, what on earth are you doing at home? And I'm going to tell you, there, you, want to you want to destroy your marriage relationship? Call each other names. Swear at each other. Just don't have God-honoring communication at home. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 4, and there's a whole list of these. If we can get those verses up here just briefly. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbor. Is your home a place of truth-telling? Is it a spot? Are you hiding stuff from your mate? Are you doing stuff online? Men, I know, and women... Guys, is there things that you, you, you're doing, you're having conversations with people, you're looking at stuff, and you're not being honest about it? Ladies, are you on Amazon all day? Whatever it may be, right? Is, uh, whatever it may be, that, and, and you're being secretive about it, can I, can I just encourage you, if you're lying about something, do you think that's building a healthy home? Absolutely not. Get to a spot where, even as Rachel was talking about, if something's hurting you, instead of allowing that to build, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, communicate that. Be honest about that. And husbands and wives, create a safe place where you are known and that you know your spouse, that you can communicate well with one another. Ephesians 4.29 that my wife just read, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is beneficial for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I would encourage you, are our words building? Are they building a great relationship or are, am I tearing something down? And then lastly, in Ephesians 4.32, right? Be kind and compassionate. Would you just turn to somebody right now and just say, be nice. Just be nice. Some of us talk to our spouses in ways we would never talk to another person on the planet. It's crazy. And so there's that old acronym. You've probably heard of it. Think, right? T-H-I-N-K. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it important? Is it necessary? And is it kind? And if it doesn't fit in that, maybe I just need to keep that to myself, right? Is it going to build what I want to out of the relationship? The second thing is this. Release anger and extend forgiveness. And we could probably do a whole, whole message, a whole series on this. And unfortunately, we don't have the time. But I just want to read to you these two verses here. 
in Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27, in your anger, do not sin. Is it wrong to be angry? No. I talked about this with Moses. But when I harbor that, and do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Did you catch that last part? We give Satan an opportunity to destroy our marriage when we harbor bitterness and anger and don't deal with it. We have to have the conversation. I call it the volcano effect, right? And you know how this works. It builds, 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 and then all of a sudden one day it's like, you squeeze the tube of toothpaste from the bottom and it drives me crazy. That has nothing to do with what it is. It is years of garbage that is built up and is now pouring over because you've allowed resentment and you've given the devil a foothold. And then later that verse we just read, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another as Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Paul talked about this in the love chapter, right? Love keeps no records of wrong. Get rid of the tally sheet. Get rid of the check marks, the moments where you bring it up time and time again. You know, when you, you remember when you did this? And you women, you have like the mind of an elephant. It's crazy. I don't understand. Back then, and you were wearing this black shirt, and it's like, what? how do you remember that? It was 17 years ago. Oh, I remember. Right? It's let it go. If it's been talked about, it needs to be let go. And that doesn't mean that there's not hurt. There still is hurt. But the anger and the holding on to it needs to be let go. Did you have something to say about that, baby? Yeah. I'm not, I don't really hang out on science websites or anything, but I um, had just come across it. It said that studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels in sleep, and reducing pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness health connection as you age. So there's an enormous physical burden to being hurt and disappointed. Um, the director of mood disorders and adult consultations at the clinic at John Hopkins Hospital. This is all research that they've done. Chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, immune response, and those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, diabetes, among other conditions. Forgiveness, however, calms stress levels leading to improved health. So God knows what he's talking about in his word when he says that we should forgive. Not that it's easy. We have to work through the thing, but it's a big, big deal. Yeah. And then the last thing that I would just communicate is make God our foundation. Because I want to be upfront. We can talk about a lot of principles. You will never have the relationship God desires for you to have without him being the centerpiece of your home the centerpiece of your marriage. It's where it all begins. That's why last week we talked about making God the priority of my life. You cannot be the leader, the husband, the lover of your wife, the carer for her, without God directing your steps because we're by nature sinful. We look at ourselves. Wives, you will not be able to respect your husband the way God asks you to because there will be moments, I promise you, that you will look and you will go, he doesn't deserve my respect. You're right. Is there moments where Rachel ever feels that way? Probably never. But the reality is, right, <laughs> it's true. Yes, it's true. Are there going to be moments, men, where you go, I don't want to love my wife sacrificially because she's not giving me the res respect that I desire and I need and, and vice versa? It's going to happen. And at some point in time, somebody's got to say, God, I'm submitted to you first and foremost and I am going to do what my spouse needs from me and what you've called me to because I love you first. There's that old illustration, and I don't even know if it's true because obviously I don't braid my hair much anymore, but uh, if you take two braids and you kind of just take two pieces and you try and they just quickly unravel, but if you take that third and you weave it through, it'll hold together. And you think about that, that's the way God's always designed it to be, that he would be the foundation of your married life. And the old saying of the family that prays together, stays together, I, we were talking about this because you hear all the time, right? The divorce rate in the church is never, is, is exactly the same as it is in the world. I don't believe that that's true. I've been a part of several churches, and we were talking about how many, how many people have we seen divorced in the churches that we've been a part of for the last 25, 26 years? It was very hard to even come up with five. That's not to say that it doesn't happen. It does. 
But when people are putting God as the priority of their life, living for him, spending time with him, being a part of church, seeking to obey him as a husband, and the wife is doing the same thing, it's usually pretty rare. And I want to encourage you, make God the foundation and the centerpiece of your home today. And that might be spending time in prayer, talking about God, what are we reading? Are we in a small group together? Is church a priority for us? Whatever that may be. And maybe for some of you, it might be coming to that place where you invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior for the very first time today. Maybe you're struggling going, I've tried everything. And he's saying, you haven't tried him. Because it's a life that's surrendered to him that makes all the difference. And I want to let you know Jesus, as we just read, forgives you if you put your faith and trust in him, just as he's asking us to forgive our mates. It's an important deal. And so my greatest heartbeat of all of this is maybe as you get into the car on the drive home, maybe you can have an honest conversation. For some of us, that conversation might start something like this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I haven't been the husband that you deserve for me to be. I'm sorry I haven't been the wife, the respectful wife that God's asked me to be. And for some of us, it might just be, what can I do to better love you? What can I do to more respect you? Because we want to make a commitment to build a great marriage. Not average, not okay, but on the foundation of Jesus Christ. It can be incredible. And my heartbeat is, what will be that choice for you today to say, this is what we're going to do to make that great? Would you have that conversation on the way home and say, no more average, no more okay, no more secrets. Let's plow ahead together to experience all that God has for us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, we are just so grateful for the institution of marriage that you created And, Lord, we confess that there are moments where it's challenging. And, God, I can't even begin to imagine all the details of emotions in this room, some that are just excited, some that it's great, some that it's been difficult and challenging. But, Lord, I pray that for each one of us that you would have given us something this day that we can walk away with. So, Lord, for me as a man and for the men in this room who are husbands, we confess we need your help to lead to love, and to care. And may we not just say it, but would we start to demonstrate it. May we make a choice this day to do something a little bit different to demonstrate those things to our wives. For the wives in this room, that there would be respect through words and through actions and attitude. And God, above all else, that we would build this precious relationship all upon you. And maybe you're here right now, and quite honestly, you would have to say that You've been trying, things have been hard and it's been difficult and maybe you're just coming to that place as a husband or even as a wife to say, I've been doing this all on my own, trying to do life on my own and I know I need a relationship with Christ and if that's you right now, I wanna encourage you to say maybe something simple as a simple prayer. God, I need you. Jesus, I believe you died for me and I wanna pursue you and submit to you for the rest of my days. Would you forgive me, give me a brand new start and build in me, build in me the person you want me to become, who you've destined for me to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.